My name is Nicolette Moore. I am here to share the story of how trauma has impacted me greatly and why it's the very reason I do the work I do today. Growing up, I was the fourth child of seven and my mom and dad, strict Roman Catholics. We were in bed by eight, waking up at six, off to school. You know, it was just very regimented. As a young girl, e even well before anything crazy happened in my life, I didn't necessarily vibe with that. <laughs> I always felt like there was some type of disconnection in the house. When I was even three, I remember the, the first time I got a tricycle, I ran away from home because I was looking for my real parents. But it wasn't an abusive home, not physically all the time. There, there were some physical abuses, but my parents were very much just a byproduct of what the boomer generation, and they did the best they could. Fourth of seven child children, so there was definitely a lot of chaos in my house. When I was younger, I, I felt disconnected after the things we'll talk about today, I certainly felt invisible. It was a hard home to grow up in. Looking back now as an adult, I understand a lot of why my parents were the way they were and why we were raised the way they, we were. A lot of noise, but not a lot of attention, if that makes sense. By the time I came along, my mom was just overwhelmed. She stayed at home, played the role of housewife. My dad worked. My dad was carrying on the legacy of his father working in the oil industry, so his job was very demanding time intensive. There were many days where he would be gone before school started or right around school time. I never really felt super connected to my dad. I was always just really afraid of him. He's just big man, deep commanding voice and I loved him. I was definitely a daddy's girl. He had that way with me where he could just look at me with the eye and I would just fall apart. I'm a little negative around Catholicism and religion because of my upbringing. A lot of what I witnessed from my parents was out of tradition, obligation, a sense of they had to go to church. They had to put us into catechism. But there are many times we'd go to church and my dad would be angry at traffic and being not nice to people in traffic. And then we'd be, you know, the first to bolt out of the church. So for me as, as, as a child witnessing that, I always thought that it didn't feel like it was out of love. My mom will often say that I was born needy. That I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard that phrase from my mom. You were just born needy. You are just born needing love. Maybe my heart has always been on my sleeve and I just wanted validation. I wanted to be seen. I wanted to be cared for. And I don't know that I necessarily felt that growing up. My dad's side of the family, I just loved going to see my grandma and grandpa. They had this big, beautiful house that had these long hallways. And as a kid, it was you know definitely bigger than it probably is as an adult, but it was just one of those homes that kind of felt like a castle. And every time we'd go over, the whole family would gather. And my father was the oldest of eight kids, so had lots of aunts and uncles, lots of cousins. And so family gatherings were always a wild time. You know, lots of personalities, lots of energy. And one day we had gone over, I can't remember the event, but my cousin was there. He was one of my favorite. You know, he was like the playmate because he was my age. He was the one that I'd hope and we would just play for hours. This one day we are playing in my, my grandfather's front room. It's like a study and, and we were having a good time. The moment in time <laughs> that everything changed, he asked me if I wanted to play doctor. I didn't know what that meant. And he ended up taking me to the couch and he pulled my shorts down and I just started screaming because I knew what he was doing was wrong. Like it just didn't feel right. It felt wrong. I felt violated. And I screamed and screamed and screamed. And all I remember is my parents and his mom banging on the door. They had to essentially break in the door and he was on top of me. They had to pull him off of me. And I remember them sweeping me out of the room. My parents swept me out of the room and that was it. Like they didn't talk to me about it. Just essentially acted as if nothing had happened but that one day I don't even know how much time that took like I don't the timeline of couch to door opening I couldn't even tell you what I can say is that that moment in time wrecked me it was like what killed my innocence until then I was happy and thought life was beautiful and fun and perfect. After that day, my little soul was fractured. The follow-up after that, what happened to my family was division. And it was something I never, I didn't understand until in my 30s. My grandparents essentially took my cousin's side and they thought that it was normal. He hadn't really done anything wrong. A boy growing up and exploring things. My parents disagreed, but what my parents didn't understand, and, and now as an adult and a parent myself, I, I can see where it was hard for them 
how it must have been hard for them to address. But that point in time, that experience stayed with me for decades. And it would be a scene that I would play over and over and over and over and over and over again in my mind. Sometimes when I describe it, I feel like it sounds so small because it was just one event. After that, I, I didn't see my cousin again. We didn't have family gatherings anymore. We, like everything. And on that side of the family changed. I did try to bring it up to my parents years later. I think at that time, I was just too young to really understand what had happened. I just know that I was scared that my best friend had done something very bad to me, but I didn't know how to express it. I didn't really understand how to process it. And like I said, the, the scene would just play in my head all the time. I remember the first time trying to talk to my mom about it was probably around eighth or ninth grade. And I remember talking to her and saying, why didn't you ever talk to me about it? Why didn't you discuss it with me? My memory, which could be wrong, but my memory of that conversation was she kind of just, she, you know, didn't want to deal with it. She didn't, she didn't give me a proper response and we certainly didn't have a very good conversation about it. Even a few years ago, I, I talked to her about it again and her memory of it was so different than my memory. When I had this conversation with her about it, she was like, it wasn't even a big deal. And I'm like, <sighs> that probably hurt so, it hurt so much to hear her say that. She has gone for decades just with this, from my perception, very nonchalant care about it, where it really defined so much about who I became. That happened as a young adult. Shortly after that, I was bullied viciously for an entire year. My little girl body was forming. I didn't understand any of it, right? Like I was so naive, I had no idea why that would even matter. I had to take the bus home every day from school. I took the bus to school and there was never an issue on the way to school. But on the way home, there was a girl that took the bus home and I still remember her name. I remember what she looked like, but she just had it out for me. I'd get on the bus, I'd sit down next to a friend and she would just harass me and tell me that I stuffed my bra, that she wanted to prove to us you're not stuffing your bra. I don't know why, but she was fixated on my breasts. And it was a, a daily thing where she would call me out in front of the entire bus, ask me to take my shirt off. I can't tell you how many times she asked me to take my shirt off. And I would be like, no, I'm not doing this. And I would get off the bus. It was not a very long bus ride, thankfully. My, my home was not too far away from the school. I'd go home and I'd just be crying, just devastated that this girl would not leave me alone. <laughs> what also was a domino effect from that is because all these kids are hearing her harass me on the bus, it took it into the classroom. I remember I had a neighbor who would ride the bus with us in class one day and he said, what is it today, oranges or apples? As a kid, it was just awful to experience that. The pairing of that experience and it being an ongoing thing, plus what happened with my cousin, I, I know that that was the start of, I've had body dysphoria my entire life. I've hated my physical appearance. I have had so much self-hate and so much self-worth issues that just stemmed from this feeling of, there's something wrong with me. <laughs> you know, like, why are people treating me this way? Why can't you just leave me alone? Like, what is it about me that makes you want to attack me? It was a hard year. And, you know, going back to mom and dad, they knew what was going on. And there was just kind of like tough luck you know, just deal with it. And my mom could have easily picked me up from school. Like I said, we weren't very far. She was a stay-at-home mom. There would have been no issue for her to pick me up from school every day, but she just chose to let me keep getting on that bus. It was very, it was awful. Fifth grade, I'm, I'm this very bullied girl. I didn't really have any friends. There was this girl, Ellie, that I taught, you know, I got to sit next to on the bus. I remember Ellie. And moving into sixth grade, the girl that had been a bully, she was an eighth. So in sixth grade, there was peace on the school bus. <laughs> I didn't have her harassing me anymore. But at school, I still was not a popular girl. I had one or two little friends that we play with on the schoolyard. It hurt my heart so much in fifth grade that I, what carried on with me was such a sense of, I'm not good enough. So going into my teens, I was just never really one of the cool kids. I never felt like I fit in. At my middle school, the kids that hung out under this big magnolia tree, they were called the tree kids. I made my way into that group. The girls that were like the, the queen bees of the tree kids, they were experimenting with witchcraft. It was just a weird 
a weird thing, like some of the things I did do to try to fit in. They had asked me to take off my shirt and walk home with just my bra on. So I did it. And somebody even threw my shirt over somebody's yard. I had to go like into somebody's yard with my bra to get this shirt. And ultimately they were just toying with me. They really were not my friends. They had no intention of being my friends. Moving into high school, still very, very shy. And I, I often wonder if what happened with my cousin and what happened with being bullied in fifth grade had not happened. Would I have been more extroverted? Would I have been more solid in who I was? I did like boys. I certainly did like boys and I had crushes. And, and I had boys like me back but I was just a weird, dysfunctional little girl and the guys that I liked were equally weird and dysfunctional. So I did have a boyfriend in high school, but he was the first one who, as a, a boyfriend, took advantage of me physically. I remember going to his house one time, his mom was there. We were hanging out in his bedroom. His mom was one of the, she was very disconnected. He wanted to have sex with me. I was a good little Catholic girl and I didn't think that that was right. You know, I was like, I need to save myself for marriage. And he tried, he tried to do the act, but I, you know, like as soon as he entered, I said, nope, I got up and I like ran out of there. That unfortunately ha happened to be a very similar situation multiple times going into my young adulthood, just getting involved with the wrong guys. And it's, it felt for a very long time that all they care about is having sex. Like I was nothing. I was just meat on a bed to put themselves in. So I feel like looking back, there were so many instances of just being physically abused, physically taken advantage of. I, I just, I go back so many times thinking, would that have been different if that young period of my life had been different? Going into adulthood, the feelings never shifted. They, I think they just kept getting worse and worse. Walking through life just feeling worthless is not a good feeling, is not, is not a good come from. Speaking of advocacy and having advocacy, one of the worst situations I experienced I was about 18 years old, went to a bar, went out clubbing with some friends. They weren't really friends. They were just the wrong crowd I was hanging out with at the time. The bartender, <laughs> so there is the bartender. I don't know what his name was. I know people called him Backpack. We locked eyes at one point during the night and I don't remember ever even talking to him. I don't remember being in, in anything with him. I just know that I locked eyes with him, that I was hanging out with these girls. And then all of a sudden I wake up and I'm at the end of the bar. It's about 2.30 in the morning. The bar is out of there. Like nobody's in the bar except for this guy. And I remember just looking around thinking, like I asked, I was like, where am I? What's going on? And this guy, the bartender comes up to me and says, oh, you told me you'd take me home. I was like, okay. I assume he me because I was blacked out. We ended up going to this diner because I told him, I said, I have to get food. I can't go far without food. So we went to this diner and my brother was there with some of his friends. My brother saw me and he told me later, he said, I had a bad feeling. I felt like I should, you know, should have taken you away from that guy, but I didn't. Like he just watched me sit with this creepy dude and just let me let me go off with this guy with this stranger and sure enough we we left I dropped him off at his house or so that was the plan right I'm just supposed to bring you home I pull into his driveway and he's like no you need to come out and I said no I'm gonna go home and he walked around the car pulled me out of the car put me over his shoulders took me into his house and then effed me I just remember crying the whole time you know I've always struggled with the whole rape culture and what they say you have to do in order to qualify as being raped. Cause in that occasion, I didn't yell. Where, who, who was gonna hear me? It was a, the bad part of town. There was no one around at all. And I just remember feeling scared. Like I thought he was gonna kill me. I thought he was gonna, you know, take a knife and just mutilate me. And so I just let him do what he did. And I just remember crying the whole time, just so disgusted. It was like self-preservation. -preser you know, I don't know this person. I don't know what his behaviors are, his tendencies. So as soon as he was done, he rolled over and fell asleep and I got out of there. I ran away. That was awful, but it was a defining moment for me as a young adult. Cause then I thought I've got to get around better people. Like I cannot keep putting myself in this situation because this is unhealthy. I don't want to keep having people touch me when I don't appreciate it. I, I found this little church group 
full of kids my age. They'd get together on Sunday nights and they'd do praise and worship and read the Bible. And I was like, this is where I'm gonna be. And I ended up camping out there with them for a while, which brought me into becoming a missionary. That was one of the first times where I was around people where I felt safe and nobody touched me. It was the start of a very long journey to discovering that I do indeed have value. When I became pregnant with my first daughter, it was 2017, I had three little boys at home. Same husband, I got married in 2008 and We'd had our first three little boys and we got the news that we were having a daughter. About two or so, two to three weeks after they did the anatomy scan to discover it was a girl, I got called in saying that I needed to see a specialist because they noticed that there were some things concerning they wanted to address with me. He did a scan on me and you could just tell he, there was something wrong and he, he had a big heart and he was having a hard time telling me, but he, he eventually let me know that there were some serious uh, defects that she, she had. Chances are she wouldn't make it to term. Maybe a few more weeks later, that I could feel the energy shift in my body and her little heart stopped beating. That was a heartbreaking experience for me. I was just devastated. We did have to go to the hospital. Um, I was about six months pregnant, had to deliver her. So I was able to hold her and we buried her in our yard. It felt like everything that I had been through in my life culminated with her loss and the aftermath. I just could not stop crying. I convinced myself that it was because of all the things that had happened to me because it was my fault. And it got to the point where I was committed to killing myself and I was planning an accidental suicide because I did not want my kids to grow up knowing their mom killed herself. I just remember thinking, no, I don't want to be weak anymore. My kids deserve better than this. My husband deserves better than this. I deserve better than this. And I choose, I chose in that moment to be the victor, even though that felt impossible. I wanted to die because the pain hurt so bad. But then there's this sense of, what does that say about my daughter? Does my daughter's legacy lead to her mom's suicide? And that didn't sit right with me either. My husband and I went to go get counseling. We started the journey of healing the family. I did a lot of my own inner work. I have gone back and spoken with my mom and my dad. I've talked quite a bit with them about my experiences. I've shared with them things that they didn't know. We've had the open conversations. We've had the discussions. As a parent, I really do empathize with them. So I have forgiven my mom. I've forgiven my dad. The slate has been wiped clean. My hope in sharing this message with others is first and foremost, human to human. I know now after doing all the work that I have, I'm not alone, that they matter that their trauma was not a reflection of their worth. And if anything, it's created an opportunity for them to actually contribute to the world in a really beautiful way. I'm excited about with sharing my message is just knowing that I create connection for those who feel unsure of how to share. I've, I've been on the brink of suicide. That was, that was my darkest. I've been there before. I've been clinically diagnosed as major depressive disorder. I have had a very dark life. After the darkest, I've been able to pull myself out and see this world is quite beautiful.